Ah, good evening, Miles. Good evening, everybody. So, um, Nancy, um, would any of the Carmelite sisters be interested in um, talking to us, I wonder? I can check with them. I don't think so, but you never know. You yeah. always can ask. And I do mean, you want, oh, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm just thinking of them talking about their experience of how they went into the Carmelite uh, order. Um, and you know, why they did it and when they did it and what the circumstances were. Um, I'll ask if anyone can. You know, maybe they don't want that to be public and, you know, that's certainly understandable. But on the other hand, um, if they need more Car Carmelite sisters, maybe they'll say something that's attractive. So uh, their story of entering the Carmelites? Yeah, their story of, you know, how they came to be a, a nun and, and uh, you know, what it's doing for them now type thing. I mean, I'd love to get a Trappist monk, but Trappist monks don't speak. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So... Good evening uh, to the ninja, somebody ninja, Majol ninja. Uh, so I'm going to uh, make Miles a co-host so that he can be a, he can be a, a what is it, a flight marshal or something? <laughs> I think they called them air marshals. Air marshal. They're, they're, yeah. um, so this is a, this is an air marshal, definitely. Roll. They're apparently covert agents on flights. Yeah, they're not actually they're that co Corvette uh, covert because I was in front of one once in a line at the airport. It was a woman, and she's wearing this big necklace that has a has a badge right, right on the pendant. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so she was pretty obvious to me. I mean, maybe she wasn't obvious to everybody. Uh, you know, let's say the, the pendant was about maybe one, one inch high. So unless you were close to it, you might not have noticed, but the pendant was a badge. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, they probably make themselves known to the flight crews. And, I'm sure they do, yeah. And, but you're probably the average person on board doesn't know, know that that's who they are. Yeah. Um, anyway. Or did you manage to get it up on YouTube? Yes, it is on YouTube. Yes. It's, it's operating. Good evening, Colleen. Colleen Sickle has been a regular um, follower here. Uh, but Colleen, you should join our, our group. Um, and so let's, let me put a note on the YouTube chat. Okay, so I've done that and um, So how's everybody doing? How, how are you holding up, Sandy, overall in terms of the coronavirus and all that stuff? I feel like I'm doing okay. Um, San Diego seems to be moderately hit and the roads are clear. And yesterday I went to the beach and there were people walking on sunset cliffs where there's these really nice houses. And for a while, nobody was allowed to go. And I guess folks got mad because they, you know, just kind of at least want to be able to go walk on the beach. And so we went and walked on the beach and saw some people and 
pass them by and it was it wasn't as crowded as before they banned the beach but saw all these really pretty flowers and they just looked brighter and more gorgeous than ever so yeah really gave me a lot of a lot of peace san, san diego is a beautiful spot my aunt and uncle used to live up on the cliffs above the um above the La Jolla Beach and Tennis Club, and they were members for years. And my aunt, they were both uh, psychologists, not clinical psychologists, but my aunt had been a dean of women at Penn State University like 40 years ago um, for like 15 years. And then she took a job as the head of the Girl Scouts of America in Southern California. And then they were trying to get rid of her because of age, but fortunately the administ, uh, oh, so she was, she was teaching uh, the top cops, the senior guys in the state police for California uh, for a long while. And fortunately the the administrative building that had her records <laughs> uh, burned down magically. <laughs> and, and so she went on to uh, advise them. And meanwhile, my uncle, who was a Franciscan brother, but left the order to marry my aunt, um, he had been an advisor to the Marines in Camp Pendleton. And he was advising them on the brig. And uh, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for that one. <laughs> uh, they were always trying to fix, fix me, fix my life. And um, Oh, interesting. And uh, especially Philip, especially the monk. Uh, my aunt was much more a listener. And uh, I suppose I could tell their story. So my, my, um, my mother was born when her father was 47 years old. And she said that the first thing that she knew about her father was that he was old. Okay, because by the time she went to kindergarten, all the other kindergarten kids had fathers who were um, in their 20s, let's say. And, and my mother's father was in his 50s by then, obviously his early 50s. And the interesting thing is he lived until she was 50. Okay, he lived to be 97 years old. And... Um, so anyway, he had three daughters. One married, um, you know, at the end of World War II. One married a sailor who was into alcohol. And they got into the bar scene after World War II. And she ended up living over a bar uh, for her whole life, basically. And um, she died suddenly at 64. The middle daughter was my psychologist aunt, and she had been um, the, um, her name was Dorothy Lipp, L-I-P-P. -P. She's probably got a, a web, uh, you know, Wikipedia page, I think. Anyway, she, um, among other things, she was selected for the 1940 Olympic Games in synchronized swimming. <clears throat> However, uh, because of uh, the war, um, they didn't run the 1940 Olympic Games, so she didn't get to go. <laughs> and um, so then uh, she got herself a PhD, and while she was working on her PhD, she fell in with Eve Arden and with various other people. And there's a, there's a famous movie that involves, uh, I think it's Sonia Henney, but it, um, 
anyway, was this famous Swedish star who was had a a skiing scene, skiing down the mountain, and it was actually my aunt who skied down the mountain. Um, and uh, it was sort of a, you know, a double role. <laughs> and, and then, but she fell in with Eve Arden and Eve Arden hired her to um, go to Paris to start the Eve Arden office in Paris. Uh, however, uh, she had a mind of her own, so she decided to um, go to graduate school to get a PhD in psychology. And so that's what she did. And so from my mother's point of view and mine, because I didn't know any better, she became anti-MAME, the, the famous archetype anti-MAME. This was my aunt. And... Um, she never had children and she didn't marry until she was 45. And uh, she had met my uncle. My uncle had been dropped off at age 13 along with his 11 year old brother at the Brothers of St. Francis in New York City. Um, and so the Franciscan brothers raised him from age 13 and he was a smart fellow. So he um, got a PhD in psychology and ended up as the vice president of St. Francis College in New York City. And then um, when he was in his mid forties, he, he got a Fulbright fellowship to study in India. And in order to accept the Fulbright, he had to renounce his vows of poverty for one year. Okay, so he renounces, he renounces his vows of poverty. And, but meanwhile, uh, about a year earlier, he had run into my unmarried aunt at a conference of psychologists, okay? <laughs> the plot thickens and so, <laughs> and so uh so anyway while he was not ruled by his vows he went to india on this fulbright and he got desperately ill and ended up in a in a uh, catholic hospital in calcutta and he was very very ill and so they they medevaced him to another Catholic hospital in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, to recover from this um, dysentery that he had. And it's not, not fun. I, it happened to me once in Vietnam also. But anyway, he, uh, so he got medevaced out of India, never went back to India. And while I was in India, or while I was in Kenya, recovering for two months and deciding what he was gonna do for the rest of his life. He had this kind of midlife crisis awakening thing. <laughs> and and um, he uh, decided to, um, the thing that he was gonna do was renounce his vows permanently and go marry my aunt. And so when they were both 45 years old, they got married. Okay, and meanwhile, my, uh, my aunt became the head of the Girl Scouts of America in Southern California. They lived in La Jolla. They had a beautiful home overlooking uh, the sea up on the cliff above the La Jolla Beach and Tennis Club. Um, the, the cliff that's set back from the beach, uh, I, think you're, I think you probably know, there's a, there's a beach or a cliff there that's a couple miles back from the beach. And so up on that cliff, one of their neighbors was Jonas Salk among others. So it was, you know, a very big deal place. And uh, they became friends with Jonas Salk. Meanwhile, my uncle was writing books and I think in his lifetime, he wrote uh, 52 books. Um, and 
none of them sold many copies, <laughs> but there were a lot of them, right? <laughs> and, and so, um, uh, so there's another piece of this, which is that um, he had this exposure to being in another culture, in two other cultures, India and Kenya. And so when he was recovering, it so happened that um, my, my family was in Japan and he wanted to come back to the US via Japan. And so my aunt organized for him to come to Tokyo and meet my mother uh, and uh, stay with us. And my mother was going to Sophia University at that time in Tokyo um, on a part-time basis. And um, so he stayed with us for maybe a month. And at that time, it was pretty interesting to get to know him. And my mother suggested that he might want to write a book about managing cultural differences. Well, <laughs> he actually did write that book. Uh, and it was a topic, the first three editions of it were pretty bad, but he got smarter over the years and he got a partner in it. And so now it's the, it's a textbook in about 400 universities around the world. The book's called uh, Managing Cultural Differences. And um, uh, yeah, it was right above Salk Institute is where they were living. And uh, I think it's in its ninth edition now. Um, but then at age 75, and this was quite some time ago now, my, my aunt must have been in, born in, oh my gosh. My, my aunt must have been born in the early 1920s. So when she was 75, this was about 1995, uh, she's coming out of the driveway on Costabel Drive above San Diego, and, which is where they lived. And um, she got hit from the driver's side by another an oncoming car. It's a very dangerous intersection there. I think they've added a stoplight. But anyway, she was killed. She spent 10 days in the hospital and then she died. And my uh, uncle went on to marry another woman who I'm still in touch with, and he lived to be 91. Uh, and so I had a on again, off again relationship <laughs> with him and them uh, for my whole life, because I remember when shortly after I'd met him in Japan, I was at in college, I was probably a sophomore. Uh, so this would have been like 1965. He calls me up and he gives me uh, this famous uh, uh, sleep around, wheel around, drink around uh, lecture. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, okay, Phil, I got you. <laughs> but I didn't want to take any. I didn't re really want to hear it. And, um, but anyway, I, in, in his dotage about maybe 10 years before he died, I went and visited him and I videotaped uh, an interview between him and me, which was very well appreciated by the family. And we didn't, we never put it out on the internet or maybe we did. We might've put it on Bridges TV, but which is a whole different skip story that nobody knows anything about. <laughs> but that's a different, part of Skip's story. Uh, what anyway, was his name again, was it? His name is Philip Harris. So if you- Philip Harris. If, if you look at the, um, the dust cover for um, Tsunami of Blood, which was my 2007 book, he wrote one of the blurbs on the dust cover. Uh, oh yeah, and I see his name on uh, managing cultural differences. Right. Leadership and, skills and strategies for working in a global world. Philip R. Harris and others. Yeah, but he, 
um, when he eighth first edition. Yeah, eighth edition, and he probably, um, you know, in the first three editions, it was to it was a total crock. Okay, um, he wrote when he wrote that. I don't remember when he first wrote it, but. I read it uh, probably when I was in Japan in business and it didn't have anything to do with what a businessman should do in business in Japan, nothing whatsoever. <laughs> and, and so it was basically a, a crock and my parents used to joke about a PhD being piled high, higher and deeper. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and Philip was was the butt of that joke. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, my my aunt, uh, after finishing her PhD, got a job as the Dean of Women of the University of North Dakota. And so she was up there for about five years. And then she got a job as Dean of Women at Penn State University, which was a hell of a job, and a, you know, an important job. And and um, basically, she was the clinical psychologist for the women on the campus when things happened. And uh, she had a couple of young women who committed suicide during college, which was very tough on her. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, she had a, a real a real deal psychology experience as a as a professional uh but then from but and so my grandfather okay so my grandfather was this older man who uh his wife died in 1954 when which happened like within two or three weeks of the time we came back from kodiak and so my mother went back to Philadelphia and my grandfather ended up coming to live with us in Michigan. And he was then 77 years old. Uh, and uh, he, was, he was a true curmudgeon. And in the next eight years that he lived with us, um, he was, I recognized him as the most bigoted man I ever met. And, you know, he was against every ethnic group there is. And he had come out of Pennsylvania Dutch um, origin. So that's German, a kind of German, um, very strict religion, right? The people around Allentown and that sort of thing. You know, the people who drive horse and buggy to this day. And we actually have a picture of my great, or had a picture of my great grandfather with his black big rimmed hat and uh, my sister for all her brilliance decided to sell that picture. Um, and so we don't have it anymore, which is a shame because this was my great grandfather that she sold off <laughs> as an antique. Um, but um, so he lived with us for eight years. But when we got when we got orders to go to Japan in 1961, he said. And he had saved over the years from 50 years on the railroad. He's the one that was the railroad man who lived. Um, you know, he was an internal auditor for the Pennsylvania Railroad. So <laughs> very popular guy, as you can imagine. He had, he had been in the first class of Wharton Business School in 1900. And... Um, or around 1900, maybe 1902 or four. And so he was actually too old for World War I. Um, and um, because he was already in his 40s for World War I. And, um, and so he, when he was living with us, he was, he just had this angst about every ethnic group. And he and I were like oil and water. We could not get along at all. 
you know, I respect him now in my, in my own dotage, but, um, you know, he and I just were not friends and he was living with us. And so when my father got orders to Japan, he said, I ain't gonna go live with them Japs. And this was in 1962. So it was more than 15 years after the war was over. And so the result was that he uh, went to State College, Pennsylvania, and he lived at the Nittany Lion Inn, which is a very posh uh, hotel for 10 years while my aunt was the Dean of Women up there. And, um, you know, various things happened, but ultimately he had dementia in his late 80s and they ended up having to put him in a nursing home where they ultimately spent off all his money. And so they ended up putting him in a, in a public nursing home, which was actually better than the private nursing home. And he went on in this, in his La La Land life for the next uh, 10 years and died at age 97. I, I didn't see him after age 88. The last time I saw him, I was a senior in college and he was 88 years old. And he basically didn't remember who I was. He could remember things that happened in the 19 teens, basically, but he couldn't, couldn't remember me or <laughs> didn't know who he was staying or any of that stuff so it was it's not pretty but anyway so that's their story philip lived to be 91 and he died just a couple years back two three years ago and uh, you know we became friends in his old age um, although you know he wasn't a, he wasn't a blood relative of mine he was my my mother, my aunt's husband, okay, is who Philip Harris became. And, um, but he did write a nice forward and a nice uh, blurb for my book in 2007 called Tsunami of Blood. And um, you can find that on the um, Dropbox if you're interested, <laughs> the big red cover. Okay, I digressed a lot here, so. Um, uh, we're, we're going to talk about, um, anybody else want to tell a story? <laughs> Jess has got this big <laughs> face. Well, uh, you know, I do have a story related to the title of today's session, if anybody wants to hear it, but okay, maybe yeah, Let, let's hear it. Let's, the... let's hear it. Okay, well, I'm going to do a screen share. And so okay. Bear with me as I pull up a photo here. Um, and I just felt this was numinous. So I need to. Here comes Nicole. Nicole is joining us. Um, okay, that's not the photo. That... Pardon me. That's not the one? Uh, no. One of my it's favorite similar. people. Similar. Two of my favorite people there. Yeah. Here's, here's Hi, here's Nick. Here. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Are you seeing that? No. No. Yeah, I'm going to hit done. Yeah. All right. Um, so I was listening to Paul Vanderclay. Very interesting presentation as usual. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice I did this screenshot and the way my YouTube was presenting information was I was listening to Paul Vanderclay. And, you know, he's always grappling with them, um, you know, how there's people like Paul, uh, John Verveke looking to find the religion that's not a religion. And Paul Vanderclay is, is always trying to, in a sense, do a soft sell, you know, on his perspective of, of uh, 
Sure. Uh, of Christianity is uh, everybody's drawing from Christianity and they don't know it. Right. Kind of concept, which is, um, it's, he's stuck in his his perspective. You just presented a beautiful session with Kushbu on the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, that was cool. And, and you're talking about, you know, okay, we've got the narrative of Jesus Christ and it's very powerful and there's a lot of people are Christians and I could go into, yeah, I know there's Christians out there. Um, but Jung was all about saying um, all these religions are in some very significant aspect the same. Yeah. Okay. Then um, down below, what you don't see, because in, uh, maybe maybe everybody else does see it, but I see Skip's vision. His, I don't know if you can remove yourself, but there's a rock band called Foreigner, which is an American rock band out of mm -hmm. New York, has a British element too, uh, with uh, the lead singer guitarist. Um, Oh, his name escapes me. I, I, anyway. I, I can't remove myself from your screenshot. Okay. <laughs> but anyways, I don't know if you guys are seeing the rock band down there in the corner. But yes, they have, yes. We, my wife, Gina, and I were supposed to go and see them uh, just a matter of a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. But of course, like everything else, it's all canceled. All these big events are canceled because yeah. of the virus. Now, last night I go on to um, to see if, are we getting a refund or what's the deal? And I went on to the Ticketmaster website and they say, well, they're going to be here on November 1st uh, this year, God willing. Mm -hmm. And they have a countdown timer. And this countdown timer struck me as just the thing that I need because I don't know, you've perhaps heard me say I'm trying to bring all this together and you know actually do something tangible uh, mm -hmm. in my life and I thought this countdown timer is my perfect motivator that by the time this group comes and plays I will have actually for better or worse done something now um the thing that's significant about Foreigner, and I will conclude with this, is their, I think their biggest hit ever, global international hit from the 80s, was is the song, I Want to Know What Love Is. Mm -hmm. And there's a beautiful, if you ever look them up and you look up their original video, it's a beautiful video. Um, and, and it just, it, it brings different ethnicities. Uh, you've got, you know, the band members who are Caucasian, but they're singing with this black gospel choir. And there's another storyline or two in the, in the, goes on in this music video. But um, anyway, you know, to me, in summary, you know, I want to know what love is, is really encapsulates uh, what we are hearing so many people saying, um, what is this, the meaning crisis that we're in? So I just thought that was sort of numinous when I saw all these images and particularly with what Paul Vanderclay was talking about at that moment, I've got notes, but I'm not gonna go into that. Um, and it was just a numinous moment and I did a screenshot. And so mm -hmm. now I have it as a motivation. So I'm going to stop sharing, that's my story today <laughs> cool. cool so the so foreigner came up just randomly while you were looking at the paul at paul's well thing. not entirely randomly because um the previous day i had been listening to it and i don't know how youtube moves things around you know on your screen uh your, you've got your history you've got your watch later and whatever, for whatever reason, um, it pulled you and Kushbo, Kushbu and Paul Vanderclay and what he was talking about, you know, we're all searching for the answer to the meaning crisis. 
and then Foreigner and their countdown timer, then I'm going to be seeing them November 1st. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, yeah, this is, uh, I got to take a, a screenshot of that. So, <laughs> so it's not entirely, you know, it's not totally random that Foreigner would popped up because I yeah. hadn't been listening to them. And so you right, know, right. There's, there's these logarithms or no, what do they call them? Algorithms? The algorithms. In yeah. YouTube that they, 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 YouTube pushes stuff to you that it thinks you're interested in. So that does a pretty good job of it. Ah, I just okay. want to, go ahead. I just want to check. Um, yeah. yeah, okay, go ahead. Miles, that's one of my favorite songs. That's one of my favorite songs. Um, yeah, I want to know what love is. In fact, it's um, uh, very danceable to it. It's a nightclub two-step beat. And um, I've always thought that probably 90% of songs and songwriters are writing about love. And really, ultimately, I think all songs um, about love is um, this yearning for the the self, the, the spirit, the, the God, or whatever you want to call it, love. I, I just call it love. And that's the ultimate, um, ultimate feeling that we get from these, um, a lot of these love songs. It's um, all about the expression of love. And oftentimes I think too, when I listen to a particular love song, that it's a, a message for myself. It's, it's also like a personal message. And I think some songs like that hit from Foreigner hits millions of people around the world. So it um, really hits a, or set, shall I say resonates with that archetype of love. So I just wanted yeah. to- Yeah. I, strangely, I don't know why they came, were to come back to Calgary because they were just here about a, a little over a year ago. And I saw them for the first time live then. Um, the interesting thing too, is they are playing at what is called the Gray Eagle Casino. And that is on the Tsutima Nation. And I'm, uh, as you know, I'm really exploring the indigenous wisdom and learning about my indigenous uh, neighbors. And the Tsutima Nation is, um, the, they're, they're one of their most recent uh, chiefs. Uh, his name is Lee Crowchild. And I actually, part of this initiative that I'm working on is uh, I gave him, um, actually Skip knows some of the story. If he remembers, it goes back a ways. Mm -hmm. But I, I uh, had the honor to meet with Chief Lee Crowchild and present him with what, what's um, a numinous I consider it, uh, well, I consider it at least a uh, somewhat of a um, uh, work of imagination. What What's our term for this? Active, you, you know, you active, 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 yeah, active yeah. imagination. So there's, right. there's this active imagination work that goes along with it. And as I said, the, this foreigner is playing on their, their nation. And uh, so there's a connection there. Um, and then the other thing, um, you know, it's, it's made me think as, as serious and as devastating as this virus has been, um, a lot has shifted um, because of the fact that we're in this lockdown. So for example, if it wasn't for the lockdown, I wouldn't be telling you this story the same way, right? Yeah, right. So, and then the learning that we've all had, um, that, you know, if we think about it, there is a divine purpose to everything. We just have to open, be open to it, right? Right. So, so um, since you brought it up, let me... Um explain to you what the numinous things that happened to me because um you know i'm not um i i'm open to numinous events right and um so 
I don't recall actually what caused me to order the Bhagavad Gita last week, but I did out of um, Amazon. And I ordered two copies of it. <clears throat> and, um, and when it came, um, you know, I was, I was kind of looking for things that connected with Jungian psychology, right? And, um, and so I'm gonna share a screen with you. Let's see, where's the screen share? Okay, so I'm gonna share this image with you. So this is the image of the Bhagavad Gita, which is um, Arjuna is going into battle and there's uh, his chariot driver is named Krishna. Now at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is just, you know, a friend of his that's driving his chariot. But at some point during the, during the chariot ride, Arjuna starts to recognize Krishna as a manifestation of God. And, um, and so it happened. And so le le I want to share one other image with you because uh, I was looking for images to put with my reading with, with Kushbu. And so here's another one. So here's another version of Arjuna and Krishna riding along in the chariot, except this chariot is quite different, as you see, uh, because it has uh, the sun as the, as the back uh, defensive part of the chariot. And uh, so it's quite, a, it's quite a powerful image, actually, I think. Um, so anyway, the whole Bhagavad Gita is about this chariot ride. And it's about deciding whether to go to war. And, um, <clears throat> and so I got my two copies of the Bhagavad Gita, maybe Thursday and Saturday of last week. And I just opened it. And I opened it to page 116 of the Penguin Classic version of it. And um, all, of I, all of a sudden I realized that Krishna was describing the self. And I said, wow, that's numinous. And, and you know, we have a, a sub subscriber in India who's interested in these things. And it, by the way, her mother happens to be named Gita. Okay. And um, so the Bhagavad Gita is about a decision about whether to go to war. And so they're riding along and Arjuna, who's the, the noble and who's being driven in his chariot by Krishna, um, is trying to make the decision about whether to go to war. And, and so I just opened this to page 117 and I look down to, to verse 23 and I see that he's talking about Mount Meru. Well, Mount Meru is a, is a place in Buddhism that the Dalai Lama talks about, but this is Hinduism. <laughs> and of course, Buddhism is, a, is a, um, an apostasy from <laughs> from Hinduism, but anyway, I'll leave it, be that as it may. Okay, so I want to read this section because in this section, Krishna, who is the God image, the self, is describing himself. And so think of this as a description uh, that Dr. Jung would endorse as the self. Okay, and so the last verse from Arjuna says, mover of men, tell me again in each detail about the yoga and the form of yourself. I never tire of hearing this nectar. And then Krishna answers him. And I'll read this. It goes on a bit. And I'll have to read it again with Kushbu. But 
because it's so powerful in the way of uh, describing the self, and this re relates to all of ourselves, uh, it's worth paying attention to. So page 116 of the Penguin Classic of the Bhagavad Gita. And I'm in the 10th discourse and I'm at verse 19. The Blessed One said, listen, I will tell you the heavenly forms of myself. I will tell you the primary ones and there is no end to my extent. Best of the Kurus. Thick haired one, I am the self. I dwell as the refuge of all beings. I am also the beginning, middle, and end of beings. Among the Adiryas, I am Vishnu. Among the great lights, I am the sun shining. Among storm gods, the Maruts, I am their chief, Marichi. Among stars of the zodiac, I am the rabbit marked moon. Among the Vedas, and uh, just so you know, uh, in the East, they tend to see uh, the rabbit in the moon instead of the man in the moon. <clears throat> okay, so then verse 22. Among the Vedas, I am the Sama chant. Among the gods, I am Indra called Basava. Among the powers of sense, I am the mind. Among beings, I am thought. Among the Rudras, I am Shankara. Among the Yakshas and Rakshas, I am Vitesha, Lord of Wealth. Among the Vasus, I am Fire, the Purifier. And among the mountains, I am Maru. As you see, that's numinous for me. And because the Dalai Lama talks about Maru and Mount Maru. And he's, he says that it's not clear whether Mount Maru was ever a physical place, but anyway, it's a place in the psyche. <clears throat> Verse 24, son of Prita, recognize me, I am Brihaspati, the head of household priests, the ruler of sacrifice. Among the chief of armies, I am Skanda. Among the waters, I am the ocean. Among great sages, <clears throat> I am Brigu. Of things that are uttered, I am the syllable Om. Among sacrifices, I am the soft recitation. Among things that do not move, I am the Himalayas. Among all the trees, I am the Ashvati fig tree. Among heavenly sages, I am Narada. Among the Gandharvas, I am chief Chichatracha. Among those who are fulfilled, I am the wise sage Kapila. Among horses, I am Indra's Ukaishavas. Recognize me to be born of nectar. Among great elephants, I am Indra's Airavata. Among men, I am their protector. Among, heaven, uh, among weapons, I am the thunderbolt. Among cows, I am the wish-granting cow. I am Kandarpa, who makes progeny. Among serpents, I am their king, Vasuki. Among snakes, I am the endless one. Among sea creatures, I am Varuna. Among ancestors, I am Ariman, their chief. Among those who snuff out life, I am Yama, god of death. Among the Daryas, I am their prince, Pralada. Among those who count, I am time itself. Among the animals, I am the lion, their lord. Among the birds, I am Vainatera. Among purifiers, I am the wind. Among those who bear weapons, I am Rama. Among sea monsters, I am Makara, the crocodile. Among rivers, I am Ganges, Janu's daughter. Arjuna, among creations, I am the first, last, and middle. Among insights, I am insight into the highest self. Among those who speak, I am discourse. Among imperishable sounds, I am the letter A. 
among words joined together, I am the simple link. I alone am imperishable time. I am the arranger facing everywhere. I am death who sees us all and the beginning of that which will be. Among female deities, I am good name, wealth and speech, memory, intelligence, constancy and endurance. Among chants, I am the great chance to Indra. Among meters, I am the perfect Gayatri. Among months, I am Margashira, Shirsha. Among seasons, I am blossoming spring. Among those who cheat, I am risk. Among the brilliant, I am brilliance. I am victory, I am resolve. Among those who possess the truth, I am truth. Among the Vrishni people, I am Krishna Vasudeva. Among the Pandavas, I'm Arjuna, winner of wealth. Among wise ones, and of course he's referring to the, the noble here. So I'm among the Pandavas, I am Arjuna, winner of wealth. Among wise ones, I am the author Visa. Among poets, I am the poet Ashanas. Among rulers with the scepter, I am authority. Among those who want victory, I am wise conduct. Among hidden things, I am silence. Among the wise, I am wisdom. Arjuna, among all beings, I am the seed. There is no creature moving or unmoving that would be without me. Scorcher of the enemy, there is no end to my di divine forms. Here indeed, Example by example, I have declared this the true expanse of my power. Understand that whatever powerful being there is, be it splendid or filled with vigor, it comes to be from only a small part of my brilliance. But what Arjuna is the purpose of this abundant wisdom to you. I stand holding up this entire world with only a small part of myself. And that's the end of the 10th discourse. So comments? Is anybody still there? <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, quite amazing to have that recitation. One uh, description after another, you think you've got it. And then there's something that comes along and you go, no, you know, my thoughts were too small. My ideas were too small. And he keeps uh, breaking those down uh, so that you open up to, uh, I guess I would use the word silence, but uh, the essence of things. Right. And I mean, I was extremely moved because I, I just by you know synchronicity i open to that page okay and that's in the 10th discourse so it's not in the beginning of the book and um i'd I like to add something go ahead um, i just um you know um agree with nancy that it was a really wonderful discourse on just everything it, it's basically it's, a, it's, a, it's, this, it's saying, I'm the all, I'm everything, <clears throat> but breaking it down almost like I am this, I am that, I, I am, it, it's, it's like a chant and it's a hypnotic chant. So if you just let your mind go and just listen to it as you recite it, um, your mind just kind of slips into this, um, different realm and i think that's the reason why it's written that way to get the mind off of other distractions and focus in on the all so i just wanted to chime in with um, nancy on that right and so my insight was that Jung went to india for three months in 1937 and keeping in mind that the Bhagavad Gita was written between the second century BC and the second century AD. Nobody's exactly sure when. And 
he was introduced to Hinduism and to the Mahabharata of which the Bhagavad Gita, as Kushbu said, the Bhagavad Gita is the cherry on top of the, Mah the uh, Mahabharata, okay, which is among the sacred texts of India. And, um, and there's a lot in here, okay? And so when I read that, I had this insight that, you know, Dr. Jung was talking about how, you know, we're all part of the same thing. And he, he commented that all religions were um, methods of, of um, psychotherapy before there was psychotherapy, before anybody had thought of psychotherapy per se. So the religions all developed in a very organic and evolutionary way over many years. So they naturally developed differently. Um, but I think what happened in 1937 to Dr. Jung um, was that he realized that that Western religion was way behind uh, Hinduism and Indian religion, and, and naturally so, because um, you know the Aryan nations came up out of India um, into Europe, right? And so the Indians have had far longer than Western Europeans have had to develop their psychic self, let's say. And, um, and so he observed that fact. And then he came back and said, well, geez, <laughs> to him, I think my insight was he observed to himself, oh my God, we're so far behind the Indians in terms of the way we express these things that, you know, my work has to be focused on Christianity, which basically is what he did for the rest of his life. And, um, you know, it's interesting that in his um, near death experiences in 1944, when he had his heart attack, um, you know, what he envisioned was a, um, an Indian guru who was in meditation. And that Indian guru had his face. And he had the insight that when that Indian guru woke up or came out of his meditation, that would be his death. That was his, what he perceived. And, um, and so then he got busy and, and started to write Mysterium Conjunctionis and Ion and um, uh, some of his other work. He had focused on alchemy before that trip, but um, he started to focus on uh, Christianity after that trip. And it's, so it's very telling what, what happened, I think. Um, and uh, so, uh, so anyway, it had, you know, the, my insight was, geez, Kushbu and I could read this and Kushbu could read it in Sanskrit and I could read it in English and it could be very powerful to be people because Sanskrit is this is the sacred language that the Indians developed over thousands of years, which you know isn't used in conversation but is used just the sounds of it are used um, to um, to make a difference to people. And it was interesting that over this weekend, uh, Debbie was taking a, a lesson from a, a Buddhist um, Gesho, which is kind of a bishop of uh, Bud Tibetan Buddhism on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And I mentioned that and the Tibetan Bud Book of the Dead contains the instructions that a Buddhist priest would give to a dead person at, during the 49 days after their death about how they would go into a new life type thing. And um, 
And so, let's see, I lost my train of thought there, but um, Oh, I know what it was. So, uh, so Kush, I mentioned that to Kushbu that Debbie had been in that lesson. And Kushbu said, you know, uh, years ago, first of all, she said her mother's name was Gita, which comes from the Bhagavad Gita. But, and I had contacted her on Mother's Day. And she said, I, I was trying to figure out how I would honor my mother. And uh, I came to her with the idea of doing these videos on the Bhagavad Gita, and she said, what a perfect gift for my mother. But she was also saying that years ago, she was uh, dealing with a, a man who was, uh, he was psychotic, and uh, he was, he was, zoned out on mushrooms <laughs> in India. He was zoned out on mushrooms. And so she said she read the Tibetan Book of the Dead to this fellow in Sanskrit. And um, she said as she was reading, she would stop and, and want to explain the commentary to him too. And he says, no, 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 just stick with the Sanskrit. <laughs> which he probably didn't understand, but he he could hear the sounds and the sounds were resonant with him. And uh, so I thought that was a very interesting story about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. But anyway, on Mother's Day, I suggested to Kushbu that we read this book um, because my best way to learn <laughs> to read a book is force myself to read it in front of the camera and then, then there's no turning back, right? So, uh, so this morning we started and we read the first uh, 11 verses of, the, of, the, of discourse number one in the Bhagavad Gita. And I hope we'll continue for another month or two to read all the verses. Kushbu seems motivated to do that. So anyway, comments? I should shut up. <laughs> I've, uh... Uh, hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, uh, Nicole. Oh, I got back here. Oh, God. Yeah, that's a beautiful idea to read the Sanskrit and the and the English. And um, and I'm just getting really a lot of from what um, Miles said before, and what and how this is continuing. It's kind of spontaneous, and and it's it's just so lovely because I just feel like at the moment, like. There's something going on with words and when I speak, I can't get, like I'm, I'm transmitting some other communication, but it's not in the words. And it's just like, like I know that there's a meaning crisis, but I just feel like my meaning is, I'm not in a meaning crisis, that the meaning is, you know, it's just, it's for us to, 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 to build our awareness around and to make it ourselves. Yes. And, um, and it's amazing being on this platform to just get so many different uh, expressions of that, like in all these different forms. It's just, uh, that's what keeps me coming back. I just, uh, and today I, um, you know, we go through stages, it's like, and this coronavirus and everything that's happening at the moment is just so drawing me through spiritual things that I've always been scared of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like once I discovered Carl Jung and, and it just, it's like putting everything together in a, such a meaningful way and 
yeah, just really giving me courage to do what I want to do, which is um, totally unique to me. And, and I don't even know half of it, but like starting something without knowing what is going to, you know, just, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. Well, that's, know, what, to, and that's what we all have to do. I mean, when and I... I've just, I've got such, I'm so challenged around time because I keep missing, because I want to live in this spontaneous way where I can capture all the things that fill me up and make me feel good. But at the same time as I'm doing that, I'm out of alignment with my life. It's just, but, and I have to keep on, um, yeah, just... And so many things happen where I just fall down, you know, and I just, and then I go, no, everything's fine. Just <laughs> get back up again, you know, and just keep attaching to this something higher, so, something more, you know, and it's just, but we don't always have, well, I don't always have access to it. Sometimes I'm not. It's there. It's always there, but I'm not seeing it. Yeah, because it's unconscious. And all, yeah, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's like, It's kind of what, what Nick was saying the other night. Nick Chen was saying where... I, I, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I thought that was the most unique way of explaining something that was very obscure and but meaningful to him. Mm -hmm. And I could really relate to it. It's just, um, yeah, how these inexplicable things happen. And they can happen at any time. Surely. Yeah. You know, any time, in any context. And I love that. Yeah, I just... Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Well, as I, I, I've quipped a few times because um, I didn't realize until I read it somewhere from Jung that that philosophers are about the logos. Okay, they're they're trying to mm -hmm. rationalize and explain things that are unexplainable, right? And and so they try to do it by slicing and dicing and very rationally. And um, John Verveke, who's this friend of Paul Vanderclay, so I've never actually interacted with him, but he did these 50 videos on awakening from the meaning crisis and wow. and you know basically what he did was what um academics do which is to uh, uh flashbang you and shock you by all of the things that they know okay so so he went back to i don't know pythagoras or whoever um in ancient times and came right up through all the philosophers. Uh, but it was only in like the last two minutes that he indicated really that he knew what the meaning crisis was about. And it wasn't about that at all. It wasn't about any of those people that he had talked to in 50 hours of videos. He did 50 hours of this stuff. <laughs> wow. And yeah. And, and Jung, you know, Jung was very down on academics. And uh, my friend uh, Thomas Arst, I, I think, um, uh, I think I can find what he said about um, about academics here. Let me just see. Um, Well, I'll I will find. say that John Verveke is a terrific, terrific source to um, expand a person's vocabulary and to, mm. he, he knows he's got so many books of different philosophers behind him there and then he's always pulling them out and you know so and so said this and this person said that but anyway at the end of it all you know. Mm. Uh, uh, it's all very is it the word is it prosaic is that the word yeah I guess esoteric it's 
Mm. Yeah. But Does it really but add up to much. These, the the these people are always looking backward instead of looking forward. And, you know, I, I quipped at one point that the way to get meaning in your life, and, you know, these nihilists have confronted Jordan Peterson and Verveke and others. And, you know, they, they say, oh, well, you know, so what? This is all blah, blah, blah. And, um, and, and here's, uh, here's what uh, Ars says. He says, nothing causes greater tedium and disregards the central questions of our time more than the ignorance and prevailing bustle witnessed within the self-referential self -referential and detail-obsessed chairs of our university institutions. And yeah. <laughs> in all likelihood, nothing revelatory will come from their discourse. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, you know, I, uh, I have often said that, um, you know, uh, liberal arts education, which I'm a big fan of liberal arts educations, because they teach you how to learn. But what you learn in them is only information that's good to make you interested at, interesting at a cocktail party. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so I got a bachelor of arts degree from Hamilton college wow. and I didn't take any math or I tried to stay away from science as much as I could. <laughs> <laughs> and so the first thing I did was end up as a second lieutenant in the U S Marines. And the next thing I did was I became an artillery officer. So an artillery officer is a guy who uses all this math to put uh, artillery round at a specific place from guns that can be as far as 27 miles away. And it turned out I was the top Marine in my class, which got me as a result of that fact, because I was the best artillery officer among the Marines in my class. I was number three in the class, but I was number one among the Marines in my class. Um, and this was an army school. Um, but as a result of being number one Marine, I got sent to Chinese language school and I never touched another artillery piece in my entire 23 year career. <laughs> not not <laughs> once. I was never, well, I, I did see some artillery pieces in Vietnam, but I, but I never got closer than I would say 50 yards of, a, right. of an artillery piece. And I certainly never was assigned to an artillery battery or anything. And it was all because I was the best artillery. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and yeah. so... So my point though about liberal arts is that it teaches you to learn how to learn and, but none of it is really useful in terms of the nuts and bolts in life. And so if you wanna have a meaning to life, you have to get a life, okay? Yeah. And we, we developed this, you know, statement, get a life, probably 40 years ago in the United States and people say get a life but I don't think they understood what it meant or maybe a few people did but um, I didn't really I didn't really grok what it really means but it means that you know you, you have to get yourself into life and and uh, make some mistakes and do things that other human beings do. And when you're in college, which is who these folks are talking to, Verveke and Jordan Peterson, um, you know, young people tend to want to be given everything they want, especially now. And they, they tend to want you to tell them all, all the, just tell me the rules and I'll follow the rules. And they think there are rules and there are no rules. Yeah. Okay, the problem is yeah. there's no rules. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, how, how, how to be original. <laughs> you know, it's like how, how to be original. We don't, we wait for somebody else to sort of, and, and going to university and learning something, you know, I mean, that's fine, but like, it's about creativity and creating something new. And, and people go on saying that, you know, there's nothing original because everything's been done and blah, 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 you know, but like, but that, that's, I don't follow that, that concept. I actually do believe that anyone can, can do it. And it doesn't matter about your education and whether you've got this degree or that degree and this right. master's degree or that, you know, like I had lunch with some people a couple of days ago, this friend of mine, who's a pretty high level academic and, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been trying to break into that world for so long and it just doesn't work for me. Like, because, and, and I just, um, like, that's my thing of like wanting to be, wanting to ask somebody else to give me permission to be this person or, you yeah. know, and, and just, but I, I'm never able to get there because I'm just... I don't know, too diverse. And um, I really enjoyed what that lady was when she reminded us about the Landmark Forum on one of your talks the other day, because I've done a lot of Landmark. I find Landmark to be pretty amazing, pretty sort of, for me, like just to, but, but you know, the biggest thing about what's great about Landmark is that you're in a team, you're in a group. It's so hard to do something as an individual person. You have, we have to be connected. We have to, we have to be connected. And it gets so challenging because the way society is and the things that are happening and, and what's happening in with postmodernism. And I've got a lot to say about Jordan Peterson too, because I think he's got a little bit of a, I've been look, watching him for a long time, but, um, but, yeah, there's, it's just so hard. And, and like Jordan Peterson say is, well, I was really surprised to find out that he was, you know, on antidepressants and he was in hospital a while yeah. back with all these health issues. And, you know, I just think, oh God, like he's working so hard and he's really passionate and, and so connected to his, what he's trying to get out and it's so heartfelt and authentic you know he puts so much of himself into it um and he's obviously you know speaking to a lot of men particularly i think um mm -hmm. but there's something about him like <laughs> like it's probably just my projection but like why is it that people who are in positions of power and authority always come crashing down <laughs> at some point like in such a horrible way like and it's you know it's almost like yeah that, that frightens me yeah i i don't know if he's even coming back um you know uh i've got an interpretation for that oh go ahead but nick go ahead One, one sec. Um, I mean, obviously, this is just uh, my interpretation, right? Um, but I think what Nicole was saying was something like um, people in this position of power, they, they followed, they, they, no, the word you used was crash down. And um, for me, this, I make a distinction. There'll be two kinds. One, the first kind will be the normal, norm, normal kind, normal meaning that. Um, everyone's trajectory will have, you know, a rise, a fall, uncertainty, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's what you were talking about. I think it's um, more the crash. That's why you use the word crash, right? And um, I used to be yeah. a fan of Jordan Peterson. I went, I went pretty deep into his stuff. I mean, I still, I still like his stuff, although um, I, I don't really go into it nowadays because I find it very jarring in terms of, you know, it's very, I, I find it almost one-sided. Mm. Even though everything that he says, I can't, dis I, I can't disagree. Um, and what, what I was going to say, actually, is my interpretation of it is that um, he was drawing, he assumed a certain archetype. 
and and so um, he was yeah. he was actually drawing power from that. And I don't mean this in any negative way. I mean it in a, I mean on one hand, you know, on one hand we look at him and we can see that oh he's hardworking, he's working so hard, he's traveling, his schedule is packed, and we see it in that um, rational continuous way. But at the same time, his schedule is packed and he's working so hard and he has all this energy also because he is possessed. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, he's possessed. And he is and, possessed. Yeah. yeah, and I don't mean this any bad way. I think you all understand exactly what I mean. It's an it's an it's a it's an ecological interactive thing that that yeah. um, involves his own psyche and a collective psyche, which is all you know. It's and everyone's embedded in that archetype, yeah. right? And and so I yeah. feel that that given that his archetype or his vehicle of expression was kind of one sided. His crash might reflect aspects of that, which can go down into his the expression of his um, health and, and stuff like this. Like well, this. And it, it relates to his the issue with his wife's health, right? Mm. Because mm. because he was building up this superstructure of logos uh, throughout that couple of year period, and you know I agree with him a hundred percent about Bill sixteen. C or whatever it is of the yeah, yeah. of the Ontario government, and you know that's that's a crock. When you you know if you have required speech, then that's the beginning of totalitarianism, which he rightly researched and figured out and said, and and so you know you can you you can't order people to say a certain thing. You know it would it would be like you know, and anyway, you can't require people to say a certain thing in life. And when something on the arrow side, on the chaos side happened to him, namely his wife's illness, it, it yeah. kind of blew up his entire worldview. And he didn't, he realized he didn't have anything on that side of the equation. And uh, Nicole, you'll be interested. There's a there's a person that's following us on uh, YouTube who calls him or herself Blessed Aussie. So there must be someone else oh, yeah. in uh, Australia that's involved in this, but she, oh. uh, this person says, right, but he puts his emotion into it and it uses his energy. Well, I think that that's definitely true. I mean, yes. it, it, you, could, yes. you could just see it using up his energy until he finally got somewhere and he didn't have anything left. Yeah, go ahead, Miles. So what I'd like to share is that when I first encountered you, it was on Paul Vanderclay's YouTube channel and you made right. a comment about Jordan Peterson. Right. And your, your comment was what you were describing. Jordan Peterson is so slanted to the logos that the eros is being neglected in his commentaries. Or was all being, logos what, all the was, time. was being elected, uh, was being neglected because as Blessed Aussie says here, he has the animus still. And, um, you know, I, at one point, uh, I wrote him a long letter uh, observing that he had missed the point about Jung, even though you know, he had repeatedly used, was name dropping Jung left, right, and center through many of his uh, lectures. He was using Jung, but he didn't understand Jung. He hadn't, he hadn't grokked the fact that Jung was on the opposite side of the equation. And I wrote this letter to him and I just put it on a comment on one of his uh, lectures. And I think, I think it disappeared very quickly. I think he hit it or something, but it definitely got through to him. And it was right after that, that he had this, he had this sudden crash. So, um, you know, I don't know if that, if somehow mm. I affected him or, or got him to realize, boom, there's something. Um, this, was, this was actually um, reflected um, Switching out from, from Jung's history, right? Um, 
the, one of the best um, translations of the I Ching was by um, his friend Richard Wilhelm, who spent um, pretty much a, a big chunk of his life in um, China learning from a master, and then that's why we have that translation. But yeah, in Qingdao. He moved back to um, he moved back to Europe, and Jung actually sensed a split in him, and Jung actually tried to um, tried to inform him of it, and and, and like basically Jung wanted him to you know um, take heed and 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 do something about it because he knew that this kind of thing would manifest as a health thing, and true enough, Richard Wilhelm actually died not too long after that um, because of uh, this inability to integrate the Eastern and Western sides of himself. Because mm. when he went back to, to Europe, I, I think he found himself unable to integrate his European side. Yeah, that may be true. And, and these things can manifest in, in ways such as, um, you know, if you can't integrate it, you smoke too much or you drink too much or you start taking yeah. taking light drugs or something like that as a compensation for something that's not in balance. And, you know, what I'm hopeful is that we can have, we can help people find balance, right? Because I have nothing... Uh, I have no real issue with with uh, anything in Maps of Meaning, in, in uh, Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning. And I agree completely with his last two paragraphs, which is his conclusion. Um, and um, what he said he had done, uh, which was kind of an obsessive thing, kind of an obsession really, was that he had gone through every sentence in that book 10 or 15 times. And I believe it 100% because it just shows. But the book is so tightly packed that no, nobody without, I don't know, um, 15 hours of psychology classes can get it, can read it and just get it. I mean, and I, I listened to it and I said, whoa, this is, this is so tightly packed. It's like, it's like taking Jung's 20 volumes of the collected works and compressing it into one type of thing. And, you know, it, it's, it's just so, so undiluted and, and so, so much without, let's say, enough um, I think without examples type things. I mean, he's, he's going through and he's saying, this is a fact, this is a fact, this is a fact, this is a fact. And he's, he's not wrong, he's right. But, but the average person just can't read that much like that. Well, it's and, like John Verveke's 50 hours of talking about the meaning crisis. Right. And, um, uh, you know, bringing in all these philosophers and this guy said this and Aristotle said that and, you know, and can I just share something sure. numinous? So it's rather numinous that I met Kushbu here. She, she was brought to us via Jordan Peterson. So I know. thank you, Jordan Peterson. Uh, he, and, keep, he, and, he, he keeps bringing us people to us, which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, um, and here's something else that's happened. So I have almost, I could say I have another life on, on Zoom you know, with this other group. And I just, Kushbu just impacted me. And I thought, I need to introduce Kushbu to this other person and her name's Jackie Solomon. And Jackie will be talking to us on Thursday. Yeah. Thursday. Yeah. So uh, just today I was listening to a recording on this other Zoom channel where Jackie is talking about her, her, her belief, her energy in the divine feminine. Oh, and I love that, yeah. I'll to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. And now Kushbu is on this channel as well. And she's talking to, to Jackie. 
And Kushbu says she brings in Skip's presentation of Dr. Darian Tay mm. from Zurich, the yeah. Indian analyst that we enjoyed. And Kushbu yeah. is trying to share with Jackie, oh, well, there's these four stages of the anima, and then there's this fifth level that supersedes even Sophia. And, and Kushbu is doing a great job explaining it. Um, but she couldn't remember that the name is of this um, energy is the anima mundi, but she captures it saying it's the energy of mother nature. And it's the energy of mother nature that is going to kick our ass if we don't yeah. shape up. And I thought, my God, that just hit me. That, yeah. that struck me, that spoke to me as a man, mm -hmm. that mother nature is gonna kick my ass if I don't mm -hmm. get moving and, and get a life, as Skip's saying, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. in other words, Kushbu's statement supersedes 50 hours of listen, listening to John Verbeke, right there. Yeah. Supersedes Jordan Peterson and all his work. So anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, wow. Jackie's going to be speaking here on Thursday and uh, have an open mind. She's speaking from her heart. And uh, yeah. you know, she'll she, no, she's cages. amazing. I, we we talked to her only for ten or fifteen minutes the other day, and and I I already felt her energy coming through. So for those of you who are on YouTube, uh, this will be a session uh, of the global check in, um, which will be on YouTube. It will be at one p.m. U.S. Eastern time uh, on. Right. Thursday. Sorry. So unfortunately for Nicole, that's 3 a.m. for you, Nicole. Okay. But um, okay. on but, Friday, 3 a.m. on Friday. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so, okay. So if you want to be on live, you have to get up early. Okay. But, <laughs> right. but, yeah, yeah. but um, yeah, Jackie is quite an impressive person. Now, oh, that would be really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely it's definitely an energy that's coming through. It's really it's been a really thing, a big thing for me personally. And now like and now I'm like I've just been working with it individually, but I'm just getting this really strong push to lead with it. Mm -hmm. uh, leadership. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> like I get really um gazumped by it and um you know because it, it's such a powerful thing you know it's, it's so and and it, even in discourse and and um you know talk about academia like i find that every time i go into the academic realm i come across a woman who doesn't even realize that she's taking me down <laughs> It mm. happens, it's happened so much, like, and, you know, it's just, it's such, uh, it, it's where the feminine goes into the shadow, it's unconscious, you know, so, like, just like the word competitive, right, mm -hmm. it's just, Two, two people have said it to me, like, like they, they'll say, oh, it's very competitive. Well, here's the thing, right? This is what I've got to say to that. <laughs> if it's competitive, it's not, it's not the thing because it should be collective, inclusive. It should be, if a university is, um, you know, cutting jobs, it's not an effective university. <laughs> yeah. And that and, the people and, that are working within it should be generating. They should be building. They should be not agreeing with that, but yeah, I mean, changing. They're, they're all about getting tenure and keeping their jobs, and less yes. a, and less about um, building something new and some new knowledge. And you yeah. know that's you yeah. know. Um, you know, I always yeah. I always come back to Paul Simon's song uh, Kodachrome, which begins uh, when I think of all the crap I learned in high school. It's a wonder <laughs> I can think at all. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's so hard, you know, and um, and even in like personal relationships, you know, like because I talk to a lot of people, coaches and stuff, and you know, there's always going to be something that I do that I say the way I act, the way that I did this, blah blah blah, that's going to annoy the man who's going to decide that you know I am not I am this person so therefore I'm not the person for him <laughs> you know and and yeah. that very point is the point where a sort of different dialogue needs to happen so that a deeper understanding can be seen and felt in the conversation but he's right right nicole when he thinks that that you're not the person for him he's also right yeah okay and and so yeah yeah so the, yeah so the point is you know you can't crack that i mean i i've tried to crack the university stuff a couple of times with young that and that definitely doesn't work because everybody's threatened by Jung, okay, naturally. Okay, all psychologists, uh -huh. most psychologists who are in the mainstream of psychology um, and uh -huh. all theologians are threatened by Jung. And, you know, this uh, Ed Gray that we spoke with, with Tim on Sunday, who is a psychotherapist, he said he got in, in two years of his master's degree he got one hour on Freud and zero on yeah, Jung. Yeah, wasn't yeah. that amazing? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and so the point is that um, we have to carry the future with us. You know, the mm -hmm. point, you know, this is what Thomas says in, in, in quoting Jung in his essay that's in uh, Jung's Red Book for Our Time. And this is Thomas Arst, um, and he keeps um, talking about how Christianity is looking backward. Okay, and it it can't, you know the, and and you you hear it in Paul Vanderclay all the time when he gets when somebody asks him a question about Christianity, he, ha he has no new ideas. He simply, ha he simply learned a formula in theology school and he says, oh, well, you know, Thomas Aquinas said this and this person yeah. said yeah. that and so on. So he's very, he's very um, yeah. erudite in the sense of knowing all these wonderful facts that he learned, but he hasn't, um, looked forward to what where christianity is going if if christianity is dying because everybody's going out of the church and and uh bishop Barron on the west coast who's a, a catholic bishop who's responsible for a committee of bishops that are supposed to be bringing people back in the catholic church and he says and we're losing six for every one we bring in you know, I, yeah. I, re I respond to that as a businessman. I said, man, you're fired. You can't be my sales manager because you don't know what yeah. you're selling. And, you know, how about connecting up with the lives of your parishioners? That's a start. <laughs> but, um, you know, Jung wrote this, this letter to uh, the Reverend Morton Kelsey on the 3rd of May, 1958. And here's what he said. We're still looking back to the Pentecostal events in a dazed way instead of looking forward to the goal the Spirit is leading us to. Therefore, mankind is wholly unprepared for the things to come. Man is compelled by divine forces to go forward in increasing consciousness and cognition, developing further and further away from his religious background because he does not understand it anymore his religious teachers and leaders are still hypnotized by the beginnings of a then new eon of consciousness in, instead of understanding them and their implications. 
what one once called the Holy Ghost is an impelling force, creating wider consciousness and responsibility and thus enriched con cognition. The real history of the world seems to be the progressive incarnation of the deity. And so the point is that all the these- Blessed guys, incarnation of the deity. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. um, that I'll mean... just share, I just want to share something because yesterday was Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, yeah. the blessed deity, uh, you know, Mother Nature is going to kick my ass if I don't get off of it. And yeah. <laughs> I'm going to share this photo because all the academics and all these religious institutions, um, Mother Nature is uh, going to stand up for her own. And I'm going to show you a picture of a mother that Mother Nature is going to be protecting if we don't smarten up and just bear with me, please. It's in here somewhere. So meanwhile, while you're doing that, um, Nancy mentions that there are on YouTube videos on Word on Fire Institute with Bishop Robert Barron. And the, the whole point is, and, and there's a Bishop Barron interview with, uh, okay, uh, all right. So go ahead, Miles, while you have your image. Yeah, so um, this is a photo taken by my brother. He was up on a bridge. Wow. And this is a mother, mother black bear with her two cubs. Mm -hmm. And they're seeking some coolness in the river here. This is in British Columbia. But um, yeah, you know, we really need to get on with what's most important, you know, with respect to preserving this planet and wildlife, because uh, if we don't, um, all of this esoteric talk is not gonna do us any good at the end, at the end of the, the day. Yeah, she doesn't, uh -huh. she doesn't care. I, 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 <laughs> Yeah, she doesn't give a toot for Jordan Peterson, but anyway, yeah. um, uh, I like that, yeah, 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 right. But Nancy makes this comment about uh, Bishop Robert Barron and his Word on Fire series. Word, Word <laughs> on Fire, I'm gonna, yeah, I'll look and that I, up, okay. But hear this though Bishop Barron yeah. needs to set the word on fire. Okay, because he did an interview with Jordan Peterson, and in that interview, okay. he says, well, in order to make our message better, maybe we have to teach the catechism better. Okay, so that's more words, more words. And so these theologians haven't read the Bible. Okay, this is my Gideon's copy of the Bible, which was given to me by my Muslim friend who stayed with us last summer. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and so here's where all the, all the theologians got flashbanged by John 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, so let, let me share with you. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Okay, so that's yeah. what they've been selling for 2000 years. But these guys did not read the next 13 verses okay so verse two he was in the beginning with god okay so he's talking about christ now all things were made through him and without him was nothing not anything made that was made so does that sound a lot like krishna and what i read earlier okay four in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay, so it wasn't the word that was the key thing here. It was life and light. Okay, but Bishop Barron, I never have heard him say one blooming thing about that, even though I've listened to him more times than I can count. Um, yeah, yeah we, they've essentially... On our watch, I'm not going to condemn anybody because I'm a geek. No, I'm not. I'm not condemning. I'm only. I'm only no, saying they I, missed I, the you're point. Not. And what I'm saying is, yeah, we've missed the point, and we've allowed what Dr. Darian P 
Hecate said was technology to become toxic. It's corporations, these heartless, soulless corporations who have been running amok, um, you know, and hey, I'm the largesse did flow to me. So, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm equally deserving. But anyway, that's what uh, logos that's not been tempered with sufficient arrows ends up doing. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. so a few more points in this in these verses. Verse five: the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, <laughs> there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him, okay, referring to Christ. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So Christ was not the only son of God, because right here in John 1.12, was the right for everybody to become a son of God or a daughter of God. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and so become children of God who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, so there are people that are called to God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory glory as to the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so that was verse 14. So the point is that Christ's whole ministry wasn't about the Word. It was about light and life. And um, and it's not about passivity. Right. And my personal experience is that the denominations, the Protestant denominations that I've have attended to, and even the radio or the online ministries, they will, they have a very powerful message that can lull a guy like me into being passive because, oh, Jesus has done it all, you know, hallelujah. Um, and I've now realized, you know, having listened to Skip and what he's talking about today, but yeah, those who don't know Jesus, I would say, are going to be, are, are the ones lulled into being passive, you know, and it's kind of actually time to get off our ass. And well, I mean, serious. you know, the, the a lot of the Protestant churches, at least, have been selling a get out of jail free card, okay? It, he He died for our sins, so we can do anything we want. As long as we believe in God, we're, we get home free, right? <laughs> That's the get out of jail free card. And I lived very comfortably with that, Skip, for a while. And I thought I was, you know, okay, it's, everything's done, taken care of. And now I've realized, uh-oh. Yeah, and, and, you know, the Catholics can go into confession and they can confess anything they want to. The priest isn't going to do anything about it. He's just going to take the sins off their conscience, right? And, um, but the problem is that it's our world and we have to live in it. <laughs> okay. Um, and what comes up, can, can I just say, so just what comes up while you were sharing that was um, what came up for me was the, the, Yes, like I hear you, and but when you shine, what actually happens? It's like you repel people, and sure. you end up very isolated. And 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 what what comes to mind is you know this journey of this awakening, spiritual awakening, um, particularly for men. I think this is what triggers off suicide. You know and. And I've had a couple of people talking to me lately saying, 
what I said in one of my videos a few months ago, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in this world. I wasn't saying I was going to commit suicide. I was just saying I've come to this awareness that this is where I'm at, you know, and all mm -hmm. these people came in and said, oh, you should go and see a counsellor. And, and I said, no, that's yeah. not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying that I'm going to do something about it but I don't know what that is, you know, yeah. and, and I'm on this path and, um, but you know, it, it's, it, it's such a challenge for, for certain people because it takes you right to your edge. And, and what comes to mind is um, that guy who was part of the men's movement uh, and I read, read his book um, about, um, men's initiation. Um, what was his name? Uh, Robert, Robert Bly. He, yes, it might have been him or Ro yeah. Uh, and he oh. he committed he committed suicide. Uh, I got the book, read the book, oh, you, started watching. Yeah, you're thinking of Robert not Robert Johnson. Bly. It was um, Robert Johnson. I think you're thinking of Robert somebody else. It was Robert somebody. Anyway, um, I've got the book there. Uh, he, he um it's robert johnson he who his, wrote he, he shot she, his and wife me. he shot his wife and then he shot himself and i was taken aback i was like what yeah i started talking to i rang a friend of mine who's in the mankind project and i'm like what the and he said yeah i know and like mm. i said can you talk to me about this and he didn't want to talk to me about it he said oh no i can't and um, there's, there's this, which makes the story that I make up <laughs> from well, that. Nancy that says that Robert A. Johnson was not married. I, I don't know about that. No, it's not Robert Johnson. It's, um, where's the book? Here it is. Um, oh, yeah, it is Robert. That is a book by Robert Bly. No, it's Robert Moore. Here it is. Robert Moore, who wrote this book, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. This is an amazing book mm -hmm. about men's archetypes, the archetypes. It's, it's yeah. really interesting. And um, Yeah, that's a counterpart to what Pictet was talking about the other day. And I think okay. that this is really, it's, it's really constellated. It's really like for everyone. Sure. Now, because we need, we need men to stand up, right? But, but there's a lot of men who are doing a lot of work on themselves, who are really struggling and they, but they, they do go off into the wilderness, never to be seen again, <laughs> you know, like. Uh, I'd um, like to add and just another thing. I'd just like to add another thing because people are listening to what I said about, you know, you can't be passive. You have to get up and work if you're a man, especially. Because in First Timothy chapter twenty, or First Timothy, First Timothy twelve twenty, I think it is, it clearly states women are saved by the fact that they're women. You know, so I'm I'm going to maintain yes. that women are automatic Christians. Now, yes. this is my individuation. Yeah, we're connected. We're connected. Yeah. We, and we and God told Adam, yeah. you're going to have to work. Now, people are going to say to me, oh, Miles, but you're not saved by your works. I agree. I have to be truth. I have to, it's not work, but it's truth. Yeah. Bringing, not being passive about truth is what is necessary in my reading of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the truth is I, I'm firmly committed to say is a lot of the truth is what Skip is presenting that Jung sorted out, that there is, a, there is something that's the same about all religions and the Bhagavad Gita yep. uh, or the Blackfoot metaphysics that I'm learning about right here in Alberta. There's, there's something truthful about it all. Mm. And that's what we need mm. to work towards. Yeah. As, as men, yeah. particularly. 
Yeah, as yeah. men as men we do. But uh, Nicole, I think that the issue is that men expect to have rules. Okay, that's kind of what the logos is. So yeah. they want they want yeah. handrails. Everybody wants handrails. They they say handrails. Well, I mean, you know, I used to have young Marines come to me and they said, they would say, uh, I don't want to be dealing with the politics. I just want you to tell me what to do and I'll do it. Okay. And yeah. so, so that's exactly the way most U.S. Marines are. You know, they, they'll, if you give them a mission, by, by God, they'll go do it and they'll do it in lockstep. But uh, they don't want to have to work out the politics. And the problem is that it, it, it's all politics. Life is politics, mm. right? Yeah. And, and so just, I'm just looking for my picture of the Vierge Aubert. <laughs> um, but anyway, never mind. It's, I probably, oh, there it is. Aubert, rather. Vierge. Okay. All right. So, Here's what, what um, Miles was talking about. Um, this is the Vierge Ouvert. And there she is. Okay, so this is Mother oh. Nature. Okay. Here, this is Mother Nature. Oh my God, okay. that is really. <laughs> okay. It's really yeah. like, I okay, hate that. Yeah. Right, <laughs> and, and in, inside Mother Nature is God right yeah okay and, and in fact wait a minute let me show you show you the other picture i'm gonna stop that share and share another one okay so here here's the way it looks when that image is not open okay it looks like this it looks like uh, the virgin mm -hmm. mary oh, wow. it looks yeah. like the virgin mary with the christ child right yeah that's yeah. what it is yeah, if it's beautiful. if it's closed right it's, it's called, yeah. it's at the Musée, Musée de la Moyen-Age uh, in France. Mm. And, and it's called the, the Vierge Ouvert. Okay, and so here, here she is again. Let's see, let me get it, sorry. Okay, so here she is again. So now, in this version, I mean, it's open. It was closed before. <laughs> you can still see the Christ child there, right? And the, yeah. er, the apple. But inside of her, God yeah. is inside of Mother Nature. And, okay, so then there's God, and then there's his son Christ being crucified down below, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? But, mother, mm -hmm. but mother Nature is the origin, okay? And so here are all the yeah. people on the inside of her skirts that are that are praying up toward either God or Mother Nature, right? Okay, so this was uh, in the 17th century, I think. I think this is around 1660 that this uh, Vierge Joubert was created. And actually, I got this image from Jordan Peterson. So he knows wow. this. Right, he talked about it in a yeah. lecture one time, and so I looked yeah. it up, and you know, lo and behold, that's what it was. But it got suppressed by the patriarchy, okay, because they uh -huh. didn't, they did not want to admit that Mother Nature was on top of it all, right? Yeah, uh, right. And, and so that's kind of what we have to get into here in terms, mm. uh, in terms of this next few lines. Really, or, this is really linking, linking into my artwork and things I want to do, which is uh -huh. really great. Getting really focused and inspired. Yeah. Can and, you send me a copy of that image? I'd yeah, like sure. to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, okay, the beers Every morning, well, most days out here, I go for a walk in the graveyard, and every and I every time I go to the graveyard, I I just find the um the the headstones really beautiful, and uh, the way that the cemeteries 
on top of a hill in the sun and, and today I was looking at the back of the cross with all this um, sort of white marble but stained and oh it's just really yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's interesting because one of one of my dear friends who's been on here a couple of times Terry um, she and her husband for the last two months ever since the coronavirus thing started have been going on tours of graveyards in central Kentucky. Yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> because it does yeah. like it's it, it is really life affirming to do yeah. that, you know, and just each time I look at a different gravestone and um and just look at the person's name and their age and and just think, wow, you know, who was that person and what um you know, sometimes their whole family say, like, you know, it's. Yeah, I mean, all of Buddhism is is uh, built around death. Okay, in other words, yeah. they're in all the teachings of Buddhism. They're talking about death, basically, and um, and remember the medieval monks who, when they would meet each other in the morning, would always say "Momento mori." remember death mm. right or remember mortality right because as Jung pointed out we get one life what are you going to do with this precious divine life that you have that's the question okay <laughs> and and um you know if you're going to waste it by shooting yourself in the head or something like that well that's not too good so you know what what's going to be the meaning of your life you know what are you going to do between now and then i mean remember what i said about my father he looked like he was dying in a hospital bed and he weighed 112 pounds and he was weighed like a he weighed like a uh, skeleton and i said what are you so upset about and he said well i'm worried about kicking the bucket which you know means dying and I said, well, don't worry about that. We've had a hundred billion people try it. We have no complaints. Just work on what you're gonna do between now and then. And his demeanor changed instantly. I mean, I literally saw it change on his face. And it, it's actually, I saw a similar change in you when you were talking with us the, last week where I saw a transition, yeah. right? And yeah. And um, and he went on to live another eight years. I mean, we everybody yeah. thought he was dying. Everybody in the family, including him, thought he was dying, and he didn't. And yeah, you know. And I saw the moment that he decided not to die. Okay, that's that's yeah, the point. interesting. Yes, and, yes, and, there is a higher consciousness. Yeah, and I saw the moment in you where you yeah. decided to be Sophia, you know, and I started, I to, and I started to understand what you mean by the love doctor. Okay. Because yes, I am. I am trying to bring through this, this energy of, of a certain type of love um, that transcends attachment human type but right. is and and it's um and even if you know a person gets a little bit of it doesn't matter but like i'm i guess i, I i'm trying to increase my own spiritual capacity by stepping into the love doctor yeah because when i was first discovering he, it, like I, <laughs> when i was first hearing that i thought that what you meant was you were dealing with people on relational problems, you know, husband and wife type problems. But not really. In the, yeah, in that moment, I realized that the love doctor is about love. Yeah. I mean, it's like unis mundus yeah. type love. And, and yeah, and that's very powerful. And it, it, it happens in conversations because when I went, I was when, when I went off and was a bit of a gypsy for a while. And, but whenever I'd talk to people, they suggest that I 
do this thing like and I just decided because I used to live my life where I just didn't listen to other people and then I thought she you know this is crazy because it's not working I need to do something different maybe I should listen to what other people are saying to me and follow that path and see where it leads and so that's what I'm doing but it's really difficult because I struggle with my own ego of like going well who are you to be the love doctor what you know like and I get all sorts of projections and things like that and Mm -hmm. but I'm really putting effort into into creating something live that is um that happens through conversations too like um and and just through each person's unique whatever it is that resonates for them that they want to look into or investigate or you know it's not prescriptive it, it's very like the hero's journey of you know and just encouraging and coaching people to go on that to, to do that for themselves sure. you know, to, to um see anyway better shut up <laughs> no no you don't have to shut up not at all <laughs> But, but like, you know, I, like I still str- I struggle, like I find it really hard to fit myself into how do I lead and how do I do this when there's all these like formulas on, on how to be a leader and how to do this and how to do that. And, and yeah, that's, um, all, that's all handrails, right? That's all logos. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, like how to open my heart and like, I've really worked on it. You know, I've really worked on it. I, I just, I work on it a lot, you know, and, 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 well, I'm, and glad going into the I'm glad you mentioned Sorry, the ahead. hero's journey, Nicole, because yeah, that that's it. Like it's it's not. I was using the word work, but especially yeah. for men, it's do this hero's journey um, and do as Skip says, get a life, Miles, kind of thing. And um, I'm not saying that. And to I would. You. I never. I never heard anything about the hero's journey in the the time I've spent in different denominations. Um, it's all like sit in your, you know, come to church, sit in rows, the the big man's at the pulpit, you know, listen. You go and mm-hmm. have your little small group chats and, you know, okay, see you next Sunday. There's yeah. never, I never mm-hmm. heard anything about a hero's journey and any of that. Yeah. That's why mm-hmm. I'm saying it's, it's to me, it's it's a message of passivity. You know, stay at your workstation. <laughs> kind of. yeah. yeah, I like that. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, the hero. I I guess I heard about it in Gestalt, and then and now I'm I've kind of dipped back into it, and I'm really interested in integrating it into some kind of coaching package, or yeah. or just like I guess what I do now is when I talk when you talk to somebody, you can pinpoint where they're at. You know, you can because sure. people go off. They go off the path, you know, like they might, they might become an alcoholic or, you know, they might, but I I do believe that. Because they don't understand what the path is and the path is, right. And, and the point is don't follow someone else's path, make a path for others, right. Instead. And so if if you think about, Uh, for example, the Star Wars film, the very first one, right, which is Star Star Wars 4. Okay, let me, so the Star Wars movie is, you know, something traumatic happens, and you have to go do something, you grab, you gather together a motley crew to work with you, (laughs) right, right, so, so he pulls together Princess Leia and the two robots, right? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and and then you go have some adventures, uh, and you know eventually you have an achievement. But that's the first half of life, Nicole. That's my mm-hmm. okay. So think of it that way: that that when we're born, we're wild animals, and we have to learn how to be a human being in the first half of life, however long that takes. You know, Jung thought it took to at least 35. And, you know, into the time when you're actually a parent yourself, uh, because you're, 
you're too stupid not to become a parent, right? So you're sucked into life type thing, right? Yeah. And, and so, but the hero's journey ends as that movie ends when Luke Skywalker walks into this throng of people that are in a big auditorium and he marches up to the center and they're giving him a medal and that sort of thing. Okay, now you're a hero, Luke. What's next, right? And mm-hmm. that's yeah, and that, right. And and so that's yeah. the midlife crisis, okay? Because yeah, okay, you're you're a hero now, and you have all these medals on your chest, and people call you general or whatever it is. Um, but but what are you going to do with the rest of your life? What does your life mean? Okay, now you've made your fundamental contribution to the collective, whatever that is, okay? And, and that's what, what the hero's journey is to, to become a human being, a mature human being and make some contribution to the collective, okay? Which, yeah. every, which everybody can, can say, that's great, okay? You're a father or you're a mother, you know, you've, you've done something, you've done, you, you're a father. Um, but then once you've done that and, and once the kids are grown, you know, and you're 45 or 50 and the oh. kids are out having their own hero's journeys, now what? Okay, now what? And this is the empty nest yeah. syndrome, but it's, that's, that's where people have to start thinking about your idea of love right and you know what what is love what is what are we going to leave behind on this earth what is your um what is your panel legacy yeah what's your panel in the great mosaic of life what's that going to be and and there's no one answer there's no one answer everybody has to come to their own answer whatever it is. And okay, you know, it's fine to be a mother all your life. My mother-in-law is, you know, the archetypal mother. She, you know, raised her kids. She took care of her husband through illness until he died. She did everything right. And she still is doing everything right. She's 90 years old and she's still a mother. And that's her contribution. Okay, it doesn't have to be, it, you know, you don't have to be Mother Teresa. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I get it. yeah. But that's true. For a, and in her case, she fills in the blank spaces because she's a librarian and she does a lot of reading. And so she lives vicariously other people's lives, um, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you know the question is would you rather be the hero of a novel or you, would you rather be someone that that others write about you after you're gone and say wow this person made a difference you know made a difference yeah. for my life made a difference for many people's lives and you know this is what i see in in some of my mentors, right? Um, even Thomas Ars that I keep talking about, you know, he, he made a difference for me and I recognize that difference. And I'm trying to point out this, is, this was Thomas Ars contribution because he broke through this silo of Jungian analysts who only want to talk about their profession within their profession and don't want to share the wisdom outside of their profession. Okay, and, and, yeah. and that, was, that was the breakthrough that he achieved. I mean, it was something I was thinking about, but wow, when I, when I read his essay, which is the first one in this series called, uh, you know, Young's Red Book for Our Time, I said, wow, this is profound. I mean, this, this man, has thought about this way farther than I had thought about it. And I, I would, you know, I wrote to him about it and I, I complimented him about it four years ago. And, and 
as a result of that, we struck up quite a friendship. And, um, you know, then as I'm going back, talking to Jungian analysts who've written in this series, now there's four volumes of it, but in most cases, they say, I didn't know him. Okay, they didn't know him. The only way they knew him was because he edited their essay. But it was him that brought, got those essays out of them, you know, <laughs> got them to write those essays in the first place so it could be put together in a place Thomas where- Arts. Thomas Arts was the one that, Arts was the one that got them to write the essays. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Right. Yeah, right. Be okay, because yeah. here's, here's the way the story goes, okay? Oh yeah, because that's what John um, Woodcock said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in twenty in twenty fifteen, Murray Stein, who's the other editor of the series, said, "Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't think we can have a conversation about uh, Jung and and Christianity." Okay, yeah. he was very dismissive of it, and there's a video of him saying that in twenty fifteen, yeah. and. I, I was furious when I saw that interview and, and Murray knows that I feel this way because I, I shared it all with him. And, and um, you know, so by the time I interviewed him and Thomas last summer, he, he and I were all through all that shit. But, but the point was that it was Thomas who went to Murray and got him to go out to lunch with him one day and said, we need to put this together. And Murray wasn't convinced mm -hmm. that, that anything more needed to be yeah. written about the Red Book. And what emerged then was, yeah. was I don't know, something like 70 Jungian yeah. analysts out or the, more. Out of the creative void, out of the creative void through that block, yeah. it was the thing that was in the way. <laughs> That yeah. pissed everybody off. Yeah. <laughs> Actually ended up becoming this awesome thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah that's so so this thing, this the red powerful. book. You know, the red book <laughs> itself is very powerful. Okay. And for me, yeah. I got it right yeah. away because it told me I wasn't crazy when I read this. Yeah. Yeah. And but you know, I didn't have a hook for it, but what Thomas did was he proved that that's a diamond in the rough and that yeah. there are many, many facets and each of these Jungian analysts has revealed another facet of the diamond. Okay, it's like taking yeah. the Hope Diamond or the Kohinoor um, Diamond yeah. and, and cutting it so that it sparkles just right. So Jung created the raw yeah. material, raw diamond but all these analysts who've written in Jung's Red Book for Our Time have exposed another facet of it. And that was that conversation between Thomas Arst and Murray Stein, where he got Murray to agree to do the first volume. And when they tried to do the first volume, they realized that they had two volumes worth already and it just kept going, right? And- mm -hmm. And so that was Thomas's brilliance in, in putting the whole idea together. And uh, so I have uh, to- uh, It's interesting. Sorry, go on. Go ahead. Go on. Uh, well, well, I've been having conversations with um, Nancy about the challenge that I have, which you seem to be speaking into about, because um, I get, in conversations and in like I write letters to people and I try to you know really make contact with people um but I find it challenging because what can often happen it happens to me a lot is that there's a cut there's a they cut me they 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 bar me <laughs> they, they they say no you know go away like they and it, it's 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 I write like it, it hap it's happened to me so many times where I'm so close to I'm so close to sort of breaking through this this thing um, and it's when I'm in communication with another person and they like I said before you know they they're 
perception or, or whatever it is that's going on for them, they get triggered and, and they decide that I'm the bad person. And so therefore I need to go over there and go away, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and how I, I still to this day, haven't been able to stop that from happening. <laughs> and, 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 um, and that's why I do what I do is, is to go back into myself and, and like be softer and be receptive and, and go into that divine feminine place of, you know, will this person break through their own thing and are they doing the same thing I'm doing even though we're not together? And is it is it possible for us to, because if we come back together, we can accomplish amazing things and all the energy and that gets that's gotten stuck down there. <laughs> yeah. Like well, I, it I, can just and it I, would be amazing. <laughs> but it's, I, it, I, I tell you about a um, one of these <laughs> analysts that I approached. Okay, it's exactly what you're talking about. I won't name this person because um, I hope she'll be a a guest for our check-in at some point soon. But um, she came back to me and she says, well, I'm very busy and I didn't really know Thomas Arst, okay? And yeah. so, yeah. you know, basically go away, okay? And, yeah. and, uh, and oh, I guess I had said something about Jordan Peterson and she said, and I'm a fan of Jordan Peterson and I went to see him in London and, uh, and I was troubled by the adulation that he was receiving, but, but nonetheless, I think he's a great thing. And, and that was the end yeah. of it. And so it was like, blew me off, right? And so I yeah. went back and I said, well, look, um, I agree with Jordan. And oh, by the way, I know a lot about the abuses of, uses and abuses of logos and gave, gave my credentials. And I said, and I'm a US Marine, right? Or I'm a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the Marines. And it turned out she comes back and says, well, okay, I like Marines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and so, so this person has agreed to possibly come on our check-in now in a couple of weeks. They're busy oh, fin cool. finishing a book, but it, it's about persistence, Nicole. You have to be persistent. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and don't take yes. don't take no for an answer, but also don't take yeah. yet, yes yeah. for an answer. Right? You have to. Yeah. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean anything. Don't add any me. Like don't don't yeah. let it mean anything. Yeah, I mean, I John Woodcock's a good example where I think uh, you and I got him to talk about a lot more than he thought he was going to talk about that evening, um, mm. and uh, mm. that that's kind of been our experience or my experience with all of these um, mm. very erudite, you know, experienced Jungian analysts. Um, you know, they, they think that you don't know anything and they know more than you do. But when you point out that, oh mm. yeah, maybe we know a few things you don't know, you know, it might be interesting yeah. to talk, then they, then they're in, <laughs> okay. And, and so my suggestion to you would just be persistent. Um, that, you know, very good things come to people who are persistent. Um, I actually yeah. got I actually got my job in in Japan that was a five year job by being persistent. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I never give up. That's the thing about me. I never yeah. give up. Never. Even never. though it might appear I feel like I've given up, I haven't given up. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have to find this cartoon this friend of mine had, which was. Uh, I think it was a smaller frog being eaten by a larger frog. And so the larger frog yeah. has the smaller frog in its mouth. And, but the smaller frog has its hands around the neck of the larger <laughs> frog. And it says, never, <laughs> never give up, right? That was the, that was the caption of it. So, um, 
Yeah. Okay, so um, Blessed Aussie has been saying a lot of things. Um, blessed Aussie, I have to find out who is Blessed Aussie. Yeah. <laughs> Another Aussie, that's great. Yeah, so Blessed Aussie, Na Nancy is not a Aussie, but Nicole is. <laughs> okay, and then at the end she says, um, or I'm assuming it's a she, but it could be a he. Uh, whatever you think love is usually is what love is not. Love is mm -hmm. unconditional and brutal. Okay. Fair yeah. Enough. Well, yeah. yeah. It, it is can be brutal. Dry. Yeah, it can be brutal. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I, I have the bruises and scars to prove it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. Anyway. Um, Okay, we better wrap up here because we've been on two okay. and a half hours. And so tomorrow uh, I'll c we're going to come on for an another informal session for the group to talk about um, just general issues and see how everybody's doing with the coronavirus. But I'm sure that's not going to be something you're going to be able to do at four o'clock in the morning. So, no, but, not at four o'clock in the morning. But Unless be, I am awake. But there's a playback. There'll be a playback, so you don't yeah, have to. Cool. You don't have to okay, watch cool. it. Okay. And Nicole, uh, okay. I'll Nicole, I'll send you something that I find very inspirational. It's a video by a uh, indigenous lawyer. She is. Her name's Dr. Pam Palmiter, and she's interviewing the uh, head of the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And she's wearing a sweater oh. or a shirt that says "Sisters Leading the Way," and oh, I like that. Yeah, I'll send that to you because oh, um, for me, when I saw that and I reflect on it, that's that's really empowering for me to say, "Yeah, I'm just going to let the sisters lead the way. I'll do my thing, and I'll invite mm. the sisters to call me out if I'm going astray." But you know, it's really, it's really liberating for me to just say, I, I'll do my thing, yeah. and and I'm just going to take third place, third position, put it out there, and let the sisters lead the way, and and it's liberating. I don't know. I just, well, the, I just the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. The insight yeah. I I had was the the tree of life is actually women. Okay, women are the tree of life. Mm. Men can't mm. reproduce life. Only women can reproduce life, right? Mm. And, and so the tree of life is coming through women all the time. And, mm. you know, men, you know, men have their contribution to make, but um, we, we have to gain a new way of thinking about women right a new way of approach of you know rather than this patriarchal you know um, very ugly masculinity that is is not apt anymore we need we need something yeah it permeates different. yeah it permeates yeah. the culture it, it how I like it's like lately it's come through as um, a lot of women talk about you know how they don't they, they don't like the alpha male anymore <laughs> they don't they don't like the alpha male they like the beta male they yeah. they like the the quiet one the the one that um, that doesn't you know sort of have to sort of stand up and you know be the beat his chest and say look at me look at me i'm amazing you know like it's a little yeah, bit different well, I, and i mean i i just keep pointing to our president who you know if you mm, if you looked yeah. at him objectively you'd have to say well okay he achieved everything in life he wanted to achieve including the presidency but the but yeah. the question is is he happy is there any evidence yeah. that this man is a happy man is he happy with his life did he have a good yes. life? From his perspective, did he have a good yeah. life? And I, I don't think there's anybody you could ask 
that would say that he's a happy man, including him, if he's honest yeah. about it. And I remember, I, I remember, I remember seeing when he won the presidency. I was watching, and I was looking at his son. He's got this young son who was just standing there, very quiet. And like, I thought, wow, look at this. This is really interesting. Who is that person going to become, you know? Yeah. You, you're, um, talk, you're talking about Baron? I, I don't remember his name. He was a... The younger son. Young, uh, yeah, younger boy. Younger, younger, the youngest one. I think it's the youngest one. Um, right, that's Baron. He's 11 years old and I can't imagine... 11, yeah. Yeah, he's really been haunting me for a long time, that 11-year-old boy, even in my dreams. <laughs> Strange. <laughs> Something about the the boy archetype. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah. any anyway, so some somehow somehow we have to work our way around this different perspective. The perspective that everything that's logos is a structure. Okay, everything yeah. that we have around us, we need the logos and perfection. We need it at hundred percent for products, from everything from our computers yeah. that we're talking uh, through, through books, whatever, what have you. But mm. into those products, we have to put life. Otherwise, they're nothing. They're yeah. dead. They're yeah. they're all dead. Yes. There's no life in yes. them. Okay, and so eros and chaos. Mm all of life is on the other side from the logos. The logos is fine, yeah. we, we need it, we built a civilization around it. It's the handrails we need to keep building civilization, but it's all dead, there's nothing alive <laughs> in it. That's- It's that's, so funny that you're saying handrails. <laughs> it really resonates. It's like, I'll tell you a story later, but yeah, <laughs> really funny. <laughs> so, so weird. <laughs> you keep yeah. saying things like swans, handrails. You've done it a few times. <laughs> well, yeah, there's. Uh, and you there's, did it today. You said capilla. I said what? <sighs> you said what? capilla. Capilla. Yeah, you said capilla. Oh, no. Anyway, it doesn't, don't worry about it. It's just a thing. <laughs> 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 okay when you, were the, when you were reading the Bhagavad Gita you said Kapila oh, okay Kapila was the name of somebody in the, in the Gita I think yeah it was a thing hmm. yeah anyway it doesn't matter yeah thank you for um, today I've really it's really got a lot out of it it's been lovely yeah me too I'm, I'm glad you yeah. were here and yeah. you know I don't know where we're going I keep trying to finish for Nancy the memories dreams reflections but uh but we didn't go into the next paragraph yet which you know which is key it's it's related to religion and so on so we'll try again next week yeah. I wonder if the uh, three others that are here will say a parting comment or if they fall yeah. asleep so, I see Idris is here Idris just came, so I don't think he knows what we've been talking about. But uh, Sandy, do you have any comment? Uh, no, I don't. I'm just listening. Uh, yeah. Okay. I yeah, I had to leave for a reason, but I'm enjoying whatever I'm listening right now. I'm learning a lot. Okay. So, so Idris, you need to learn to put your eyes one third down from the top of the image. <laughs> Because otherwise, you look like you're trying to climb up out of a barrel. <laughs> Is it better? Yeah, that's better, but you have to move yeah. your eyes even higher than that. <laughs> you, you, you look like this gnome that's trying to climb up out of the barrel. So that's you, you have to think about, uh, you know, this is a principle of all photography, right? Yes. When you're taking a picture of someone, whether they're a thousand meters away or right next to you, always put the, the eyes at about one third down from the top. Okay, that's, that's the way to frame a picture. Okay. Is this better? That's better, but you're still too low. 
Uh, yeah, that's better. That's good. That's good. Okay. That's good. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> okay. Not fire. Still. Okay. So, Nicholas, uh, Nick, do you have any comments here at the end? I think we might have, Nick might be sleeping. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm so, here. Yeah, oh, there he is. There he is. Hi, Nick. Yeah. What, what do you guys think? Do you have any final parting shots here? Oh, uh, no, not, 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 not today, but uh, this, this is probably unrelated, but on, um, I had a good time sharing on Sunday. And I just wanted to thank everyone who was there. And uh, the next morning, when I went for breakfast, I just thought I'll show you guys this. Oh. Um, I found a pair of new earphones. <laughs> ah. but, yeah, so it's like, it's kind of like, you know, when I was telling you, um, I mean, numbers is just- About the head time. yeah. No, numbers is just one thing, but it's, it's not, you see, because when I notice the numbers, it's, it's also not statistically appropriate that there are that many cars with those numbers. I mean, I'll send you guys like pictures, right? And you'll just, but it's actually things like, like this. So this happens to me like all the time. And it, <laughs> if it was in a bag, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't like, I'm, and, and I walk into it, you see, I don't deviate from a very normal path. And it's not like I'm in the city or what, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, so it's, uh, yeah, and yeah. Very, very interesting. Those synchronicities will be with you for all your life, I think. Um, yeah, I think, uh, oh, maybe just one last thing. Um, quite early on, Nicole was, um, um, when I first came on, she mentioned something about, um, like she understands this state, but, but she did say that when you did, Nicole, you did say that when you, you know, get back into, um, I don't know what you called it, but it sounded like your normal life or your normal doing, then you feel like a bit away from that state and you're trying to like get it together. So mm -hmm. I think that for myself, um, I don't have that division anymore. Yeah. In, in yeah, the sense right. That, in the sense that, um, okay, before this, I can understand like if um, people or even myself, like, you know, if let's say we suddenly got a new job and just basically something that we need to hold the line or, you know, be busy with in that real world way. Um, synchronicities or, or, or the access to the imaginal might, might dissipate a bit. But for mm. me, it's pretty different now because um, like even doing normal things, very, very mundane things, it's still there, you see. So I feel like I've crossed the threshold. So that kind of division mm. in a sense is false to me. But, but I mean, I, I'm not saying it's false. It's, it's about um, crossing a certain line, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. That resonates, you know I mean, right? yeah. 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 yeah, thank you, yeah. Yeah, um, sometime I'll talk you, to you about golden threads um, because we're, we're weaving golden threads here. And uh, I'll just mention to you briefly, I, I've been, one lunging along this computer of mine since 2013 and it, it basically the last three years it, it's really been struggling and i actually had to start booting it off of an external hard drive because the hard drive that's the main part of it just wouldn't cooperate and um you know but i i've maintained a golden thread with uh, a couple of individuals, one especially, uh, but many, actually many individuals. And, and we're in the process of putting a, a new company together. And the aspiration is to make it public within three years. And it's actually two companies and I'm the president of both of them. <laughs> uh, and um, and so today I was able to order a, a, a very robust, let's call it a robust iMac <laughs> that, 
that will, uh, it, it's not going to be delivered until the middle of June, unfortunately. So I'm hoping this thing holds together until then. But, um, you know, I've been surviving for like the last 10 years, but a golden thread that I made between me and this individual um, who's the CEO of the company um, in 2003 has, has been robust all through. And um, so don't give up on people, I guess is my advice to everyone. And, uh, you know, um, you know, the person in my life that made that possible and who is very dear to me in many ways, uh, very much like a son, actually. Um, he, he's a person who actually gave his kidney to his wife. Okay, his wife was having difficulty with, with her kidneys and uh, she don't, he donated a kidney to his wife. And I said, wow, boy, that's, that's an amazing thing. And, uh, you know, you, you have to ask yourself, would you do that? You know, would you give your kidney to someone? And in one respect, I mean, my brother died of liver disease and he had three liver transplants. And later, um, about maybe 15 years ago at King Faisal Hospital in Saudi Arabia, they developed a practice of um, donating partial livers. And, um, and so, you know, I definitely would have given a part of my liver because your liver will grow back. And so I definitely would have given a part of my liver to my brother. But back when he was knee needy, they weren't doing that. And so he ended up having three liver transplants and dying at just about Nick Chan's age, <laughs> but, um, but um, you know, I, so the, this individual, the golden thread that I have with this individual is, I, you know, it's invisible, but I can tell you that it's extremely strong and we should talk about golden threads sometime. And the fact that you don't necessarily, you know, there are some people in your life that you have a connection to that is indestructible, okay? Yeah. And I have a few of those, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, and I hope we're spinning a few here in this group actually, but, uh, but anyway. Uh, so I, I did promise Nancy one thing and that was to read her comment. And that is that in the Eastern Orthodox churches, Mary is called Theodokos, mother of God. Theodokos apparently in Greek means mother of God. Um, the, uh, Theotokos, I'm sorry, Theotokos. Theo and then T-O-K-O-S. So for what it's worth. So I'll send you uh, La Vierge Ouvert um, later. <laughs> Right after we hang up, Nicole, you'll have it. Okay. Yeah, so, thanks. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Okay, peace, everyone. I'll say, hopefully see you tomorrow at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Not expecting to see Nicole or Nick, but uh, if others could make it, that would be great. Uh, I'm sorry I can't do it at 1, but I have a unavoidable doctor's appointment at 1, 120. So hopefully that will be over. So peace, everyone. Have a have Thank a great you. day. Bye. Bye, bye. See you Thursday, I hope, everyone. Bye bye.